Uh, I um, want to get right into this and say uh, Rich puts it on, uh, spreads it on kind of thick, and I want to get off this high horse of uh, academic high horse uh, because I think I will disappoint, and uh, by uh, getting off the uh, high horse, I may slide downhill a little uh, uh, with less uh, distance. Um, my credentials for this occasion are probably as much personal as, um, as professional. Uh, my grandfather uh, and grandmother on the Tropea side lived in Monongo, West Virginia in 1907 when it exploded, and I learned my history uh, of that disaster from my grandparents. Uh, from Grandpa Trope, I also um, learned some history of the Civil War. And uh, I'd like to just take a minute for us uh, to appreciate a little bit of uh, what some of our um, migrant ancestors, whatever country they're from, uh, have, have contributed to helping shape the culture in the United States. So let's just take a brief look at the Trope family from West Virginia, and particularly the knowledge uh, that I received from my grandfather. I like, uh, can you see it? Yeah, I will read this. Like many immigrants, Domenico U, uh, studied U.S. history. He learned about the U.S. Civil War and the role of Linguini. Uh, he informed scholars and they searched the literature for confirmation of his story. Uh, when the scholars looked into the literature, they were encouraged because there was a strong relationship in the military history literature between uh, diet and discipline. However, when you got to the Civil War history, you found, you found uh, what you expected. No, uh, a few references to, linguine, uh, to pasta and uh, no site for linguine, but a photograph of Union soldiers eating linguine, not Confederate. And with a little pride, <laughs> uh, thinking that maybe pasta contributed to the Union victory, but Domenico did not mean Union soldiers consume linguine. Rather, <clears throat> they were led by a linguini. Yeah, exactly. Abraham linguini. <laughs> now, Domenico also had a jaundice eye, a suspicious eye toward my mother as a prospective daughter-in-law because she wasn't Calabrese. After she married my father, he gave her another message. And if you've read your Aesop, you know where he's getting it from. He took her aside after they were married and picked up a stick. This was in West Virginia. And he looked at her and he said, you break. And he picked up a bunch of sticks. He said, you no break. Threw them down, walked away. And she got the message, you keep the family together. He was suspicious because she had all of two years of the old formal school education. And so there were some doubts about her as fitting in to the family. On the other side of the family, my grandma Ferrara was deeply suspicious of the Calabrese. So we had those district conflicts within the family but they didn't create many problems, especially when we sat down to eat and drink together. But my grandmother, as a proprietor of a store in West Virginia, defied the Ku Klux Klan, the police, even the court, in trying to protect her family and her business. Her husband died young. She was humorous, she was well-liked, but you didn't fool around with her. Still, I learned some diplomacy from her. And I don't know if our technology is going to be working tonight because I had the voice of Grandpa Tropea there telling you, but let's see if we can hear uh, Grandma Ferrara uh, teaching about diplomacy. Uh, she has been a bugaboo all day. She's been messing up this computer, so let's see if we can hear. If not, even if you uh, hear, I will translate for her. But this is her diplomacy. You hear? She's, she's telling the man, I shoot you. 
I have eight children. I shoot you. So this is where we learn diplomacy. Now, the, uh, with that background, I want to make a point, and that is related to what Richard said. You know, we can rely on some family stories, some family experience, uh, some family wisdom, but it only goes so far. And this is what I, I want to try to point out uh, tonight. Uh, as um, I said, I'm going to go downhill for a couple of reasons. And as you can see, uh, Steven Spielberg, I'm not. And um, what uh, we're going to do, if I can get us on track again, is... Um, it, there she goes again. No, I couldn't get her all day. In a uh, incidentally, she became Mother of the Year of uh, Morgantown, West Virginia, some years back. Um, what I want to point out is something that... Oh, <laughs> the, the crowd is increasing. I'm going to use a PowerPoint presentation closely. I will follow it. Uh, because like a lot of old Italian men, I have that defective part of the DNA that prompts our stories to wander. And so this isn't to impress you, it is simply to keep me on track. But there's something else that's worse still about what I will present. And that is, I'm going to rain on the parade of what is normally a forum for celebration. No sports, no cinema, no culinary or performing arts, no who built what, who carved what, who made what, who accumulated what, or other imprints of success. So I support what Richard says, and I hope though the rest of this presentation may be much more serious than my silly efforts to try to entertain, um, you will you come to appreciate it. I've spent a lot of time on the explosion because that's where our roots are, but more importantly, it still remains the largest mine disaster in U.S. history, uh, and also because it is so instructive for learning about why we don't know our, uh, our migrant relatives our ancestors. Uh, so we'll begin. I will stick with this and I hope you can read and see that I read correctly. Uh, but it's not surprising that Italian American identity has been characterized as a mix of history and fantasy, an all too familiar caricature. Amidst many orchestrations of prideful heritage, we are losing those who gave us daily, its daily substance. A colleague recently wrote me, no one has ever solved the problem of breaking through the anonymity of the inarticulate, non-literate, individual immigrant. That is what most of our ancestors were. We are losing or have lost the second and third generations who were nurtured by immigrants with halting English and who did not achieve or write personal accounts. It is a difficult undertaking to validate individual lives of ordinary migrants. We will use a West Virginia disaster to illustrate this. Also at the end, I'll try to suggest how we break through at least some anonymity in the lives of two Italian women, one once called a donkey and the other a whore. Now, my grandfather, Domenico Trope, lived in Monongo, West Virginia, as we said at the time of the explosion. Unlike Linguini, his aired beliefs about this disaster were shared by many. Confusion is understandable among the Italians and Poles who suffered the majority of victims and witnessed the burial of unrecognizable body parts and bodies. Yet documents, as well as folk tales, added confusion. Some recorded errors are so primitive they may be considered unique, but they speak to flawed histories and the anonymity of migrants. Still, using a West Virginia disaster to inform Italian American history is unique and regional differences confronting immigrant migrants are briefly recognized, especially between Appalachia and the 
north, industrial northeast. There were common experiences, of course, the Ocean Crossing, Ellis Island examinations, conflicts over religion and foreign labor. There are uncommon, uh, diff there are uncommon uh, experiences, differences, some slight, some serious. There's scale and topography, and we can see a nice photograph there of Philadelphia. Uh, uncommon. Again, we have domiciles, New York and West Virginia. Neighborhoods, New York, West Virginia. Work, New York primarily construction, West Virginia almost totally mining. Also, there was a difference in the work women performed. Acquisition, in New York you buy your bread, in West Virginia we baked it. Commerce, there were independent merchants. We had company stores. Transportation was different. But the more serious differences are related to the location of bituminous coal and U.S. Ge geography and history. This shaped social, cultural, political, and economic conditions that <coughs> distinguished it from the industrial Northeast. There was another America, and for those of you who don't understand some of this Italian, I think it'll, it'll be clear from this. If not, just say, hey, what does that mean? Uh, there's another America, and that is the tradition of slavery. And here in 1860, you'll see there is no West Virginia. It wasn't a state until 1863. But if you look at the industrial northeast in green, the slave states in that big blank area, you see West Virginia jutting down into that area and full of coal. So the welcome in New York was very different than the welcome in Virginia. <coughs> the neighbors were different. But more importantly, there was these differences in company, culture, and violence. You can see the company, coal company agents. There's your administration. Military came to the aid of companies. And of course, you had lynching. Many blacks were lynched. Also Italians, the two here in uh, Tampa. And uh, to this day, the largest history, uh, uh, the largest lynching in US history was of the 11 Sicilians in New Orleans in 1891. You had peonage in the southern labor camps. Here you see workers being tagged in New York and waiting for shipment down to the south. You have peonage in West Virginia, and these words come from the Italian embassy sent to the Department of State, which was then forwarded to the governor of West Virginia. Italian laborers protested and wished to leave, were stopped by armed men of the company, held by force, put under surveillance, locked up for six days on a bread and water diet. The largest insurrection in U.S. history since the Civil War was over labor conflict at Blair Mountain, West Virginia. The miners had their own militia, but the military triumphed over the miners in this conflict. There was a precedent set at Blair Mountain, and that is that the agents opened fire on women and children with a machine gun. They would repeat this type of tactic during the Ludlow Massacre in Colorado, again with miners, with even more disastrous results. Ludlow is more famous than the Blair Mountain for some reason. But this is the Ludlow Massacre, and you can see the machine guns, and the miner, of course, with his rifle. This is the result of that conflict. That is destruction and death, of course. Uh, this is a photograph of the miners and their families in Ludlow before the massacre, and a photograph of the infamous pit. This is where two women and 10 babies died uh, during that conflict, where the fire raged above and they actually suffocated. Those three youngest children over there, the Petrucci children, died in that pit. And then John Bartolotti is another one of the victims there at Ludlow. With all of this, you welcome to Monongah, West Virginia, the KKK, conflicts, violence, and hazardous work. Many Italians went to work in this part of West Virginia. Uh, the blackened part is the combined fields, uh, deer, elk, and um, Fairmont coal field. Many Italians went there to work in Monongah, which is represented by the star, and there's a sketch of Monongah at the time. The Fairmont Coal Company was the company that owned the mines that exploded. Uh, it was a large company. They had operations outside of Monongah, such as Gaston. That's a 1908 photograph approximating the year the explosion occurred. 
And uh, there was, of course, Monongah. It's a photograph of the Coke ovens in Monongah. And the tipple at the number six mine, the tipple is where you discharge the coal into the trains. And this becomes important for one of the women, the story of one of the women. These are the barracks where the, where the uh, miners lived in Monongah. Yeah. These are barracks in West Virginia with families uh, sitting uh, or standing outside. These are the miners, some miners. Uh, it says in front of the entrance to the mine. These are miners ready for work, in one case with their mules, and another a boy who's ready to work. And boys will uh, play a prominent pole part in some of what I'm saying. Under the ground, see someone digging for coal and uh, a young boy. Under the ground, you have the young boys, ragazzi, with mules and with horses. And then you have trapper boys. These boys were employed to open and close doors, both to control traffic and air in the mines. They too will become an important part of some of these stories. This is a boy above ground, releasing the uh, carbon or the coal from the tipple, at the tipple. It's uh, hard to explain this with these brief slides, but uh, danger, injury, and death were so much a part of mining communities, not just mining, or not just for miners. Uh, you know even some of these uh, songs that were created about coal miners' daughter and uh, those kinds of things, but it was ever present. Also danger to the, to the young people who worked there. The one boy lost one leg, the other lost two legs working in the mine. However, on morning of December 6, 1907, Fairmont Coal Company's mines 6 and 8 exploded, killed 361 men and boys, including 170 Italians. This is some scenes of the destruction after the explosion. Of course, the mine head. Inside the mines, the disaster was uh, incredible. There were men who had been blown against the wall face, uh, the face of the coal, coal face, and uh, they were the thickness of pancakes. The force was so great. Here are people waiting between track, uh, the tracks between mines six and eight for the news after the explosion. But it was soon known that they were waiting for sad notices. The dead. This is an observation recorded in the U.S. Uh, uh, congressional record. The statement was made by the late Senator Neely, who was assigned as a young guard at the time of that explosion. Tents were soon filled with the lifeless bodies of ghastly men. There were bodies without arms, bodies without legs, bodies without heads, heads without bodies, scenes of horror that Earth has no language adequate to describe. You can understand why they were trying in this photo to identify the dead. This is the dead in the pine boxes. More. And here's the preparation of the pine boxes with the bodies for transport. And here they're transporting uh, dead miners to the Italian and Polish cemetery. Of course they were Catholic and foreign and there was a cemetery for them. This is the Italian and uh, Polish cemetery, still exists there in Monongo. These are the 170 Italians who died by regions of origin. And in case any of you have any relatives uh, from Italy or family, these are the paesi of origin. Um, you can see the overrepresentation of Calabria and Molise in that disaster. Uh, on my paternal side, uh, there are Paisani who died in that mine from, from both towns. This is key to understanding why so much history was wrong. Confusion mixed with tragedy and horror. Many bodies could not be identified and only parts were put in pine boxes or later into the ground. The language directing these actions was not understood by many, if not most, of the migrant observers. Error-shaped accounts, reports, hearings, memories, 
and histories in the U.S. and Italy. There were errors on the death toll. There were errors on the dependents the miners left. There were errors on the survivors. There were errors on the reported dead. There were errors on the unreported dead. Errors continue into the 21st century on unreported dead, on unreported Italian dead. These errors were institutionalized in commemorations, in ceremonials. Think of what some of the remarks that Richard made about research and activities based on research in quotation marks. Can you imagine this? Wait till we get into it. There are errors on the monuments in West Virginia and Calabria, in publications and performing arts, in video and song. We'll see if we can hear this. Five hundred miners went to heaven. He even gave an interview, passing himself off as an authority on mining. The Italians add to it with their cacophony. Notice they'll use the, he'll talk about unregistered women and babies dying in that mine. Continue a Mononga, morirono donne e uomini non registrati dalla compagnia mineraria, lavoratori in nero, tra loro anche bambini. Some flaws in documents and misinterpretations of this disaster are unique, but many are of the type that confound researchers elsewhere. When a 1907 Jones or Davis recorded Italian nome, no, name, or cognome, <coughs> surnames, they documented confusion. Here are coal company names for some Italian migrants. If you saw that list, who would you think died? I could give you another list that would look like that and it'd be Polish. There were errors on birth certificates and baptism records. It just struck me, it's a minor point, but this Felici Maselli I met and interviewed in Italy, and I just thought, you know, if this guy goes back to America, he's really Felix Massa legally. You'll see in this case that surname there, Scarfolio, Scavol, Scaviglia, plays a big part in our difficulty in locating a mother. There are church records, errors on the church records, the Italian church. Errors, of course, on marriage licenses. In fact, if that Italian church had any sway legally, uh, Rich would have introduced me as Professor Troppa. Errors on death certificates and tombstones. And a consequence many of us know is the transformation of names. Easy ones are like Calabrese to Calabrese because it sounds the same and you get a misspelling only. But there are death certificates and tombstones as well. Uh, I, I guess I went back not knowing, <laughs> but you also have U.S. Senator, or so we have here in the uh, well known family back there from Di Maria, they're called Di Mary. And when you're talking to old John, if you say Di Maria, he corrects you immediately Di Mary. John Di Maria. Di Mary. And uh, Senator Manchin, Italian extraction. Uh, also has a name change. But there's a more serious side to this. Records obscured experience and dignity, as well as events and identity. Look at this. Five equals one. While Peter Urban was long celebrated as the only miner to have survived, four others testified at the 1908 hearings, Horatio Di Petris and San Angelo. Donato Di Amico and San Leonardo. The records confuse Orazio as Kratzik, Donato Di Amico as Dan Dominico, and make it worse by stating that Kratzik identified Donato Di Amico as his brother and Leonardo as Felix. The records even create or even credit Peter Rosebeg for Peter Urban's testimony. Stories of Italian survival and personal tragedy were bewildered and lost. Orazio, one of the survivors, survived, but with a heavy heart. 
I don't know if we'll be able to hear him or not. Reverence and honor are compromised by Americanized or full American names, often many versions for the same person. When I went to the cemetery and I saw these two stones, the headstone and the gravestone, side by side, with two names approximating one another, I thought, oh no, is this a misguided honor? What is going on here? We went to the files, and for that one boy, here is what is in the files, Morgantown, West Virginia, at the university. Those six names appear in the file. Before that, the boy's father was killed in a mine. Look at his record. Two names and two fates. In that same report you see there on the right, this Ralph, as Ralph de Scipio, he lived. As Farfalo T. Scipio, he died. <coughs> the boy's mother cherished the memory of her son, who worked to help support her. She praised the boy within her, within her second family, and per her wishes, a grandson tried to honor the boy with a gravestone. But with confused information from records, and family tales. It's heartfelt, but it's misinformed. It gets worse. Dead Italians numbered. You can see the black and mark that is Italian. Two Italians there. Italian number 14 and Italian number 47. The one was injured and died the same day from a fall of slate but the other man crushed by a descending cage didn't die until a month later. But that's all we know of them. That's all we have of them, numbers. But there's a problem beyond Italians 14 and 47. This is a letter I received and have yet to respond to positively. I don't know if you can read it while I'm talking, but this man knows his family lost someone in West Virginia, and he's asking us to, to try and find him. This is a very dear person. He's married, was married to a cousin of my mother's and treated my family like a king in Formia. And so this is gonna echo a little bit of what Rich said, but with the use of Paisano or Paisani as research tools along with other skills, we may be able to discover the identities of unnamed Italians. In the least, we owe them the research effort, not more time on constructing um, uh, c constructing uh, heritage and make-believe. Unlike Italians 14 and 17 and others like them, there are records for the Monongah dead at West Virginia University. Even with records, the le the, uh, even with errors, the records offer a basis for correcting flaws and uncovering identities. The significance of the Monongah disaster is methodological as well as historical. Look what we have. We have a folder on each of the miners with a lot of information connecting Italy, family, and observations. We also can tell whether the body was identified or unidentified. Think about it. How do you identify or name an unidentified body? That's what we're facing. They missed this point in the writing of histories. Here's what happened. The company had payroll records, and they had people asking of their loved ones. It was a highly visible tragedy, nationally and internationally. And so what they did, basically, is respect the complaints of family and friends if they corresponded to the personnel records and the work site of the miners. So they basically assign names to body parts or unidentified bodies, and that's how they got their total. 
We also know where the miners lived, as well as the sites where they were buried. We know what miners went into the mine that morning, and which and what miner, uh, the miners that did not uh, go into the mine, who worked that day and who didn't. We know their fate, who lived and who died. And here you can see observations made. Some of these forms are coming from a survey or a canvas conducted after, after the explosion. We have information on non-miners. We have information on another mine, the coke yard, and the Greeks, who were living in the house without the company know it, and they were missed the first time around, which created confusion again in the history books. We have payroll records. We have personal correspondence. We have forms uh, from Italy. We have documents that went to and from Italy, all of this in the archives in Morgantown. There are additional sites and sources in the U.S. You can see that the dead as well as the living contributed to our information. There are other archives, New York, Wheeling. There are standard sources such as newspapers and those you might not expect such as high school roll, bo roll books. There are sites in Italy, in archives, in church and comune. Comune is the local administration in the Paese. Here's the church in Vallecella di, di Cador and uh, the comune in Pesco Costanza. Pesco Costanza was the home of Razio, whose son died in the mines. Uh, we also go into the field. This is Ponza, the island, and uh, this is Una Fraccion, is, uh, is a part of, of, uh, of a town, or in this case, an island. We went north and south. Uh, from the Veneto and Basilicata and even further south into Calabria. We went to Lazio to visit caves. We went to San Giovanni and Fiori and visited a jail. And in Civitella Roveto we visited this beautiful woman and this intellectually alive young man. And they played a very important part in the story I'll tell. Now, of course, when you're in Italy, you manage to celebrate as well as investigate, and I thought we should note that. In the U.S. and Italy, we met a miner who lived and descendants of miners who died. Dan Colinero celebrated the Festa of San Nicola too much, as did many other miners that day, that evening, before the explosion. And he woke too late to enter the mine the following morning. And he lived, of course, as did many others. And he lived and passed on his work from son to grandson, and they covered this in a United Mine Workers Journal. Dan and the children of miners contributed and verified information on living costs, Pisanian plans, women and family, alcohol use and Slavs, preparing gardens, and baking oven in the outside, uh, or breaking bread in the outside oven. These are the bread ovens that dotted the U.S. Uh, I don't know how, about, how much in the Northeast region, but California, there's extensive work on it. And in your rural areas, my grandfather, ha my grandmother had one in Star City, and a family member of uh, one of the neighbors came to my brother in Michigan one time, out of the blue, burst into her office and said, are you a tropea from Star City? He said, yes. He said, thank God. And he, uh, evidently, the story was that she continued to bake bread even during the Depression and she'd always send over a loaf to this family. She said, we would have starved without that. Uh, I, we try to continue that tradition in our place in Argentina, at least we, we have one. Uh, here's Dan, if you can hear him, and if our technology works, on the bread oven. There's studies of students of language. I don't know if you can pick up both the Italian and the West Virginia <laughs> influence. We met uh, Maria Victoria working in a field in Malaysia in 1983. She was two years old when her father died in the explosion. That's not her there, but that's how I remember her. She was working in the field. This is uh, the observation made about her family living in uh, House 120, and uh, they recorded her as Vittori. I, don't know if you can see that uh, there, um, but that is her. And listen, she tells us her birth year. She also told us why the mines exploded. Too much gas. 
With interviews, collecting, correcting, organizing, and analyzing data and text, as well as using our experience and some common sense, we challenged received history and knowledge of our own, like representations of boys who supposedly worked and died in Monongah. These are the boys that are often noted. It's actually photos of, from Lewis Hines. These are boys noted before work, at work, after work. They were even put on an Italian uh, publication honoring the Monongah disaster in 2007. Problem? These boys were not from Monongah or West Virginia. They were Pennsylvania breaker boys. 1908 publication is pointing this out in large part in response to some of those, the influence of those photographs. Breaker boys, boys are employed exclusively at anthracite mines and in the mines of West, and all the mines in West Virginia are bituminous coal. On the other hand, on the morning of December 6, 1907, boys were working in the Monongah mines. Ruggiero Di Sipio and Fiorangelo Di Salvo died in those mines, both 12 years of age. Now, lest we be shocked, it was legal. If the parents gave the go-ahead to the company, and they had this in writing, some documentation, it was legal for those boys to go into the mine at age 12. However, there are unsupported claims that are made in Italy and U.S. Just builds up your political capital to make these wild claims. Shows how concerned you are for young boys who died. And the claims say many of the working boys who died in the Monongah mines December 6, 1907 were not reported. Who could those boys have been? Over 47% of the dead miners were Italian. It is near certain that their sons would have been among the unreported boys who died. You follow that? Look what the documents show. 170 dead Italians, 108 were single or had no sons or only an expectant wife. And I don't mean that only in the way it sounds. 62 had sons or sons and daughters. 28, 28 had sons age 8 or above. 20 of those 28 miners had their families in Italy. What remained were eight Italian miners who had sons in Monongah at the time of the explosion. After the explosion, the survey results, results show all sons of those eight Italian miners were found alive. Challenging false claims requires identifying core sources of error and myth, and there are some identified here. It requires confronting multiple sources, newspapers, authoritative quotes, common knowledge, literature, newspaper reports. Take your pick. Which one do you want to use? Authoritative quotes. Take your pick. Every one of those uh, quotes come, uh, all but two of those quotes come from people working for the mines. Quote, no, listen to this. Quotes, memory, oh, let's get back there. <laughs> uh, I guess I should rehearse this technology before I come here, but it's a long way to. Uh, quotes, memory, and memoirs cannot stand alone as evidence, which is why much knowledge of our migrant ancestors may not be well received by scholars. And why my grandfather or my grandmother's strings. The most authentic quote, and I won't bother you too much with this, but it was a coup for us to destroy it. The most authentic quote does not pass critical examination. And that was from a mine, uh, a manager of the mines who estimated a good number died beyond what was reported. But his quote has problems of authentication, and more importantly, he didn't have the evidence we have today to support his claim. Now, without spending too much on time on this, you understand the history of Monongah has been shaped by differences in religion, ethnicity, social class, and the agendas, both of capital and labor. 
But we don't have to subscribe to any of that. In some cases, though, uh, it may disturb our inclinations. And one of them has to do with the value of men and livestock. Some writers, of course, again sounding like good guys, are always upset with the quote apparently made by the governor of West Virginia and uh, directed to a, a owner of the company. After the explosion, he asked him, how many mules did you lose? Not men, mules. Well, I don't know if you know, but the predecessor to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children was, do you know? The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Why would those old Americans favor animals over children? Because, in fact, animals were more valuable. Not in a religious or moral or ethical sense, but in a sense of cash market. So we have to understand procuring and preparing livestock was more expensive than hiring Italians or other migrants. However, numbers and job classifications do not signify individuals. A name better designates a person, and six Italians were named who supposedly died but were not officially reported. In a book published with the title Mononga, there, these are the six unreported Italians listed. The official organization that produced all the data that we're working with and archived their records is the MMRC, stands for Monongah Mines Relief Committee. Here are the six, here are six Italians reported by them. Now look at the unreported Italians and the reported Italians side by side. Do you see what I see? These claims made by historians even coming out of, of university presses, are incredible. Now, we could be fooled by that, let alone some Italian who's looking for any kind of material to grasp onto his, his heritage. In addition to analysis, there is common sense. How could a small town lose so many men and boys without saying who was lost? How could mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, wives, children, cousins, neighbors, and paisani remain silent? The newspapers were there. This may be the most egregious case. Louis Patch, an Italian, died in the mine. He was the 151st body removed. It's a little blow up so you see his name there. His body was identified in formal correspondence by a payroll officer, official. We have his burial date, morgue number, case number, grave site, and his name on the official list of the Monongah dead. Who was he? The Monongah Mine a Committee, Fairmont Coal Company, Italian government, Italian priest, and persons with whom he lived could not provide an identity for Patch. No paese or family was found. No one was informed of his death. His identity remained a mystery for well over a century. Patch. Patch. Pat. Pat. Patch. 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 So was Patch Patch? Patch Patch? Sound like he's an Apache. <laughs> well, at Ellis Island, we found a Luigi Pache. He was 22, and he arrived June 1, 1906, prior to the explosion. He was from Civitella Roveto, from which other miners came who died in the explosion. He was going to his uncle, uh, uncle Antonio Persia in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, which is you know, up the road, so to speak, from Monongah. Some distance, but not that far. When you look at the Comuni Italiani site, you find cognomi of Pace and Persia 
in Chivi Tel Aruveta, particularly Persia. Persia. When we visited the Kamuni and spent a good time in the records, we finally found a Luigi Antonio Pace. He was born November 24, 1884, approximating both the Ellis Island information and the information from the uh, Monaga Mines Relief Committee. His father was Biagio, but more importantly, his mother was Philomena Persia, the sister of Uncle Antonio. We found him. We found someone who has remained unknown for over a hundred years. Patch was Pache. I don't know if you can sense it, but you can imagine what we felt, or I felt. After all that effort, trying to figure this out, this man is listed hither and yon as a dead Italian, and, uh, but no identity, Italian identity. We found it. Unfortunately, when, we, um, when the woman who was helping us got very enthusiastic, she said, well, we have one more file to check, and that's where we ran into the fact that we did not discover him. The Comuni documents showed Luigi Pacci married December 31st, 1908, a year after the explosion. I mean, that was, I never felt so alone and, you know, you're spending your own money, you're trying to just correct a few records and uh, notify families who may be missing people. And uh, so it was an incredible discovery and a shocking failure. And I, I didn't know what to do. I just said, this was it. I, had to head for vino and pasta. Well, vino and pasta not only soothed, but the time at Pranzo also nurtured a hunch. Awkwardly phrased, but that's the way I thought of it then. If Luigi Pace worked in Mananga, the Americans did not find him in the mine or bury him. So I had to go into the paese for testing the hunch. And it was confirmed. This wonderful woman over here on the left talked about Mananga and the family that she had there and those who had uh, migrated there. This little uh, old lady down here on the bottom is Luigi Pace's daughter-in-law and a granddaughter, a school teacher who happened by fortunately and helped us make understandable. And this sweet woman, Sesta, she just made sure we had contacts in the Paese and forwarded to Gabrielle here, sitting next to her, a photograph of Luigi Pace. Luigi Pace did work in Mananga, but he didn't die in Mananga. What happened? When they were matching personnel records and complaints, some Persons in the home or in the neighborhood of the home said, Luigi Pace, or Louis Patch, they call him, he's, we haven't seen him since the explosion. He's gone. So you're picking up body parts, arms, legs, heads, what do you have? So they gave one the name Luigi Patch. Or it gave something the name Luigi, Louis, Louis Patch. But they had no more information on him. They couldn't contact the Paese, the Italian government couldn't find anything, and no one thought about a 1907 Jones or Smith and what they would hear and what they would record. So it used to be 171 Italians died until this research. That's why I make sure it's 170, not 171. Now, research that corrects errors, uncovers poignant events, and identifies non-buried souls is valuable, but more is required to break, break through anonymity. For this, Italians offer two advantages compared to some other migrants, citizenship and paisani. I will not spend too much time on this, but please understand uh, what Europe looked like prior to World War II, I, when most of the, uh, the so-called huddled masses came to the United States. You had the Russian Empire, you had the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and you had the Ottoman Empire. 
there was no Poland. There's an outline of what modern day Poland would look like. And you also had the Ottoman Empire in which was located the Greek island of Tenedos. It was under the Ottoman Empire then, and it is under the control of Turkey now. Italian miners were citizens. Ethnic Poles and Greeks were subjects. Italian miners were identified as Italian. Polish miners were identified as Austrian, Hungarian, Russian. Greek miners were identified as Turks. Just think of that. So, ethnicity is important, but you have to understand an advantage Italians have. That's why we get even more upset when we think of what we're not doing. And when you go into the files of some of the other migrants, which I have done in a cursory way, you're going to learn a lot about empires and, as we learned, about brothels in Mononga. So this African-American woman was writing the committee complaining about some behavior of a woman wanting to claim some rewards for the uh, Monongo disaster. Now, Paisani is something I will just simply say, if you look at the literature, it suggests many things, a migration chain, a resource, a social network, a means of organization, exploitation, and a research tool. Look at the distribution of the Polish miners compared to the Italians. Look at that concentration. Italians were Paisani. 45% of the dead Italians came from five Molise Paesi within a six mile radius. Six miles. Company housing was a Paesi resource. If you look in the records, you will see boss man, wife, and boarders, all from the same Paesi. And what is a boss man? That's the person who rents directly from the company and in turn charges the other Paisani uh, rent. Old Nick, who talked about the oven, said he spent 10 cents a week on his rent, or 10, 10 cents a day. And so we have here from San Giovanni in Fiore, in Fiore and here is Doronia and Frosoloni, but you can find many like this. There are also Paisani networks, and you had patrons who were helping out at the time. This is the only Italian listed among the 100 notable West Virginians at the time. Uh, he comes from the town of my father's mother, uh, and here he's authorized by families to, to help out. And he did. Here he's aiding a transaction for a miner who died in the mines to get money to his father. And the check in this particular case, the check reproduced here, arrived four days after the son's death in Italy, sent with the aid of that uh, Paisano. Most of you know about Paisani sponsored marriages. That was the old saying, you only marry someone from the Paese. And, um, but what we found were Paisani sponsored marriages that were outside of the Paese, outside of the province, two regions away. They were making arrangements between men from, uh, from Abruzzo and women from Basilicata. Why? There were only two proprietors of Italian origin there in Mananga at the time of the explosion, one from Abruzzo and one from Basilicata. They're noted here. Frank Martin is actually Francesco Martino. Carmelo, uh, Camilo Salati is the second. These are the two persons, and actually Camilo's wife was American, and she spoke Italian and lived in Italy with Camilo for a while. The Salvati and Martino stores were proximate to each other. Though they were groceries, if you look at the building, you can see upstairs, they also had room to take in minors, which they did. And so that proximity and the opportunity for marriage was, was there. And so Martino provided the women in the arrangement and Salvati the men. The first marriage was between Carmini Ferrara and uh, Caterina Giacobino. The sponsorship continued with the second marriage, and while the Paisanos, uh, while, while regions matter, uh, I just want to point out trust. Even though this all sounds very, very close, you can see that when deeds were sent, they were sent from, a, from the Abruzzo to the Abruzzo. When a check was received, it went from Noipoli to Noipoli. That is, there was no crossing the uh, regional lines for cash or things that mattered materially. However, one of those, uh, one of those um, uh, sponsors 
when he made arrangement with his daughter, it was with a Paisano. And one of the reasons it's crucial in the way they were organized is that you could have some confidence in the reproduction, not only of family, but of wealth. The expectations were understood and the character may have been known. Here we have evidence of a, the store sold to the daughter for one dollar by the Martino man who was sponsoring the other people, the marriages. And the Paisano proprietor was his son-in-law. He knew full well when he turned that, that store over to his daughter that the person who would be running it effectively was her husband, but he was a Paisano. There are other reasons that these things occurred, and here's an example or evidence of it. Frank Martin was illiterate. This is a signature Francesco Martino was illiterate. He's signing with an X. His son-in-law signs his name. So how could you continue a business or prosper with an illiterate proprietor? Now, this is... Um, oh, we still have a little time. Um, when women died, they were replaced. And they were replaced with Paisani. I won't go into a lot of detail, but here are two cases of that. And you can see when we talk why they died and with whom they were replaced. Costanza, both of these women came from San Giovanni and Fiore in Calabria. Costanza married at age 15, two weeks after she arrived in America. Talk about an arranged, an arrangement. By age 24, she was dead after having had three children. Teresa, married at age 22, had five or six children and died at 31. Both were replaced by Pazani. But there's something else here. If you look down, you can see for Teresa's death is listed as exhaustion. But look here. Deception was a convention in recording some births and deaths. Teresa's last remaining daughter and a granddaughter said she died from an abortion. Exhaustion was not entirely illusory. It only excluded the effects of bungled incision and or aftercare, whether by the doctors or someone else. In any event, Teresa could not endure more childbearing bearing and child rearing. Like Costanza, she was replaced by a paisana, a 17-year-old girl who assumed responsibility for Teresa's children and bore six more of her own. And, not surprisingly, spent a year in a mental institution recovering from her hardships. There's an underbelly to paisani, or maybe not, depending on how you're looking at this, but it certainly enabled us in following these paisani chains to see what happened to the women and children, though our primary focus initially were on the, was on the minors. There's also X in Paisani. What is the X? It's the signature when you're illiterate. Here are checks going to the widow Fasanelli, and the checks were not insignificant. The women received $200 if they were married uh, to a minor, and $155 for each child. Plus, they received an additional check of 19 for each child because they collected from the Americans more contributions than they expected. So the amounts are not insignificant. But look at the reception. When those, my, when those checks were delivered, look here at the signature. Can you see this? This Madalena is signing with an X. Here's another widow. X, X. Well, as an old parole officer, I ask, did they receive the money? You have Paisani testifying, witnessing, along with the widow's ex. But how would she know? She's illiterate. That check came from New York with English via a German bank with German language and to Italy, received by an illiterate. Well, we have one case here that's interesting, and that's the minor Luigi Faola. He had six children by his wife Maria when he died. And a year after that explosion almost, she was writing she hadn't received the money. That money was not insignificant, $1,130. We, we uh, in past work, we ex uh, suspected that you could buy two homes 
for that price on the island at that time. So when I went to meet the daughter of Luigi Feola, I told her the story. Was the money received? Without a doubt. She said, no, absolutely not. She was astounded. She carried on and she told us the story right after the father received word his, husband, her, his son was dead. He kicked his daughter-in-law out of the house with all of the children and that's why we visited the caves. She wanted to show us where they lived. It's an astounding story. She's very emotional and as we left, or I left with the photographer, we exited and an old lady had her window open on the little town, she's half door, and she's looking outside. She said, motion me over. I didn't have a pencil, no recording equipment, anything. So she says, e vero. She told me that story Conchetta told you is true. She said, and I know who took the money. I said, who did? And I swear, she said, mio padre il sindico my father the mayor you won't forget that quote but I haven't hadn't gotten around to try to nail this down until last year when I went to the island and in upstate New York to meet her still living sister-in-law or sister I'm sorry it didn't seem likely so we have the confirmation of her story, but with my untrained ear, and I didn't even know her name until last year, Sandolo. I don't know if you asked me, was she speaking Italian or dialect? I don't remember, but look it. For the, our untrained ears, many of us, when we speak to these old people, and they may be mixing Italian, maybe only dialect. Look at this. The Sindico, Sandolo, Cognato, Lavacato. Why those? Because there, the last one, for example, there was a well-known lawyer on the island at the time doing investigation of corruption. Was he part of it? And that's a hidden face of the mayor of the time. So we don't know. And a side story for those of you who have heard the... Uh, in Italy, when I was interviewing Concetta, I was talking to her and her daughter. The daughter's son was there and finally interrupted and said, why don't you talk to me? And I said, Carmenuch was his name. I said, Carmenuch, I'm interested in Luigi and, uh, and his daughter and, and uh, the grand and the daughter's daughter. He said, he's my grandfather too. <laughs> they were first cousins. When I went back to my relatives and I told them this story, they looked at me like I was strange. She said, why, you don't know? I said, what? She says, we believe the first cousins make the most beautiful babies. <laughs> So we have a different view. We also have this one minor from, uh, Richard will appreciate this, uh, uh, from uh, Campania, uh, the town of Marconi. Uh, these are just documents verifying that he, the minor did have a wife and a son, and 1813 lira was actually sent to the widow. She received it and thanked them, but we calculated that it was actually less than half the value at the time. The son who was here an old man, had a hundred and ninety-five dollars, $194, deposited in the bank, sat there for two year, two decades, collecting interest, and after all of that, he was able to buy a cow. Now, I don't think cows were that high, uh, uh, a costly item, uh, around the time that he would have cashed it, but we have to look into that more. But here again, there are all kind of ways that the widows and the other dependents may have been taken for a ride. Now, if we can get toward the end. While X implies possible abuse, the lies of Caterina and Rosa demonstrate the hardships widows faced, the actions the women took, and the consequences. Most migrant women, certainly those considered a chooch, which is donkey, or a whore, may not have their lives so revealed and possibly restored. We published uh, the life of Katerina in women's uh, studies last year, and we're still working on roses. Katerina, 
Many immigrants were considered bizarre, even crazy or pazzo, because of their dress, talk, belief, or other behaviors. Caterino, widowed by the Mononga disaster, was remembered as a crazy, coal-carrying woman who was taunted and called a donkey. This cartoon comes from a series that was a counterpart to Ripley's Believe It or Not. It was called Strange As It Seems. I remembered this woman in the tales of the family. And this is her coal pile that she collected and deposited in the backyard. Clearly evidence she was crazy. But when I went to look at her gravestone, I don't know why, maybe I was just generally visiting the cemetery, the Italian Polish cemetery there. And I had this stupid response. Oh, I thought she was loved. I don't know what that had to do with anything, but it forced me to look into her life. And so we visited and gathered data and did interviews and all of what you normally do. And her husband, Vittorio, and she were both from the same paese in two different fractions, within a couple miles at most of each other, up only about 10 miles from the Austrian border in far northeast Italy. Victoria was responsible for his widowed mother, and there's evidence of his trying to seek work at a relatively young age. The more important one is the effort to get to the United States, 1891. In 1894, Katerina arrived at the Ellis Island with her five-year-old niece, destined to cousins in Pittsburgh, and a number of Paisani. That same year as her arrival, about six months later, she married Vittorio. We're not sure if this arrangement was made prior to her departure or if arrangements were made or they met within that nexus of Paisani and Pittsburgh. But in any event, they married in Denison, Ohio, where Vittorio at the time was working in the mines. However, shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter, um, they moved to West Virginia. And this is a photograph taken in Fairmont, which is only eight miles from Monongah. And that date is tight. It's 1894-95. They lived in House 120 with five children at the time of the explosion. And Victorio continued to support his mother in Italy all those years. After the explosion, Caterina did not accept the body part she was shown as Vittorio's. This was not her husband, and she was adamant about that. Can you imagine this? Alone with five children, lost husband, very few Paisani. She was from the north. And strangers come into her house to judge her on her appearance and her plans. Let me get to that. <laughs> I shouldn't touch this here. <laughs> So look what they observed about her. No intelligence, not very clean, no thrift, no savings, insane temperature, a temper, not very good sense. To stay in Mananga, no one in Italy. Now, Richard mentioned something about analysis. We have to articulate what the data says, but also we have to surmise a little, but stick tight to the data. This survey added disgrace and threat to the sorrow of Italian widows who were required to reveal self, children, and plans to American strangers. They responded no or none to questions about resources. Their responses protected them. Their resources and whatever else remained of personal spirit and family sanctity. The mine explosion made them widows in an alien world they could little influence but one to which they need not yield. These women had agency, even under such terrible conditions. Deceit, a long-used tactic in exchanges with persons of power, whether you are an American slave or a Southern Italian, blessed the women on the start of their unenviable journeys. Another thing, if you look at this, no one in Italy but Caterina went to Italy. A whimsical woman, no. Look at what she received. One month after the explosion, she was given $4.50 a week to maintain herself and her five children. And that continued well into August. Over eight months after the explosion, until a final settlement was made. 
which she received 830 some dollars. And that's when she went to Italy. She went from Monaga to New York to La Havre, France, to the Dolomite Mountains, we suspect somewhere in late, middle, late September. She went to the Dolomite Mountains where she was from, and in the winter, this is what it looks like. When she got there, and we were informed by a local proprietor there in the hometown, when we told her when she was here, asked about that, he said, oh, that's when we had the poverty, that's when we had the famine. He said, we just had here in this town polenta. We were starving. He said they didn't even have flavoring. Nothing to put in the polenta. That's why the dried fish are there. He said they would take dried fish and run it through the polenta so there'd be a little flavor or maybe a smell. What would her future be? She's now in this small town up in the mountains in the winter, five children in a starving village. And it's incidentally, the people in her hometown did not even know of this journey, did not know of these experiences, and yet they're calling her crazy. And they're writing about her life. People have even lectured on her life without knowing this. Right away she decided, rapidly, to return to Mananga. However, a woman had to go jump a number of hurdles in those days. A woman without a husband or a single woman traveling. So that's why she had to prove this, prove that, prove this. This is her passport, included her children, in those days all were on one. And they left in January from La Havre, France, after going across the Alps again, January 23rd, 1909. In steerage, in the winter, with five children, alone. These are some notes from Ellis Island, and they weren't admitted. They refused admission to the United States because the youngest boy was ill. He failed a medical examination. Also, there was no proof of the children's citizenship. There was some intervention and some help from a society and from the sisters, which was important. But look at the, t the timeline of turmoil. February 1, they refused admission. February 2nd, the boy is admitted to the hospital. Two weeks later, the daughter, Faustina, is admitted. The 17th, Katerina and some boys leave for the society in, in New York. They're in Manhattan. The next day, they leave at 4 p.m. The next day at 1 p.m., they're returned. In two hours, they're admitted to the hospital. March 12th, almost a month later, the daughter is released from the hospital. And finally, the family is admitted to the United States. Can you imagine what she's gone through? Okay. Now, I want you to see. This is Katerina and her children. But look at the date. They're admitted March 17th. March 17th. April 1, she's in Mananga and purchased a home. Within, within two weeks. And this is a woman we call crazy. So here we have to understand some other parts of her life. The property held more than a pile of coal. It held a garden. She grew corn, grounded for polenta, preserved tomatoes, kept chicken, took in laundry, and among other things, cut the children's hair. In addition, she made daily trips to the mine tipple, where she gathered coal that fell in the loading process and from bits thrown down with a slate. Scavenging was common among the poor. It enabled Katerina to heat the house and cook. But because she was a small foreign woman, shabbily dressed, wearing man-like shoes and carrying coal in a burlap bag, she was taunted and called chooch, donkey. Daily and shorter walks to the cemetery would have earned her piety, but she would have disowned her heart with reverence for misidentified body parts and a random gravesite. We cannot know the logic or passion in her trips to the mine, but we know the ignorance that stood in her way. Too many migrants treated as chooch with no intelligence, not a very good sense, and insane temper will not have their ch uh, character so revealed. Besides, who without want would say how much coal is enough? This is her daughter in college. She had a career teaching French. This is her with Katerina in New York on the day they were 
admitted. These are her four sons, the time of their admission. The youngest boy here, he was assisted by his three older brothers who went into the mines early so he could get an education. He became a physician and practiced medicine. His son is a heart specialist currently in Richmond, Virginia, and cooperated with us on this research. Oh, she's a real crazy woman. This she is buried again with to her son, Oresti, the oldest, who remained with her all of his life. He never married. So it's important for us to validate life, not a legend, so much poetry and novels and everything, hoot, the big to-do about this Italian heritage, but we have a history that we have to dig out. Now this one is the last. Antonio Saletta Antonio died, uh, like the other miners, and we had a folder on him, house, cemetery site, headstone. But in the records, the notes suggested he was divorced, that he had custody of a daughter, and the daughter was in the house of the Good Shepherd in Wheeling, West Virginia. Curious. My good partner in crime, Janet Salvati, went to the courts and dug up paperwork. I won't go through all of this because we don't have lawyers in town, but we have a very firm timeline. Bill of complaints. Katarina had taken action, so we knew she was there in West Virginia in November 1906, but Antonio turned around and filed a bill of complaint. Without going through the rigmarole, look at the last two items in the bill of complaints. Plaintiff is Antonio. Plaintiff further complains the said defendant, which is Rosa, disregarded, disregarding the solemnity of her marriage vow has since said marriage and especially during the absence of said plaintiff in America committed adultery and had illicit carnal intercourse with one Giuseppe Lecuri. Plaintiff therefore prays that he may be divorced and forever freed from the bonds of matrimony and that the care, custody, and education of said Isabella, their said child, be awarded to him. Now understand, this legal action was not possible in Italy at the time. Here's the deposition questioning him, and he said, I found my wife uh, confined in prison and pregnant when he went back. He understood she was, it was because of burning a house, and that uh, the, um, um, that she has the reputation now of a common prostitute there in West Virginia. Paisani's also testified, basically confirming the same thing, but once she had a good reputation and then she lost it. I'm speeding through, but you can see uh, the court case. We have all, all of these records now. There's the birth, of course, of uh, Isabella and the, uh, the marriage uh, of the two, Rosa and Giuseppe. And the decree gave, Giuseppe, or gave Antonio um, custody of the child. Strange at that time. Isabella, the daughter, lived with the nuns, and this is the uh, first home she moved to uh, or lived at in, in Wheeling. And there's her uh, gravestone, her headstone, the gravestone uh, there in, in Wheeling. We have very little on her life, and I won't belabor it, but evidently she was sickly, though she did work in the laundry, which was a commercial laundry there on the site. This is simply the entry of when she entered. And this little bit of language is all the summary of her life there for, over, for about 15, 16 years. We got a very touching letter uh, recently that suggested she knew her mother was alive. And this girl died at age 21. So that was near the end of her life where she was asking for her mother. Now, I think it's important to have a perspective when you deal with some of these very touchy matters. Many immigrant grandmothers were once white widows, women whose husbands worked in foreign places, as was Rosa, whose Antonio worked in Monanga. And this may not be pleasant, but this is what happened and what was. Emigration worsened conditions for many white widows like Rosa. On the other hand, domination was enhanced for men who remained in the Paisa and lived in houses with wealth enough for a mule. They could offer more than the uncertainties of remittance from the U.S. Rosa, a poor peasant, regularly visited the house of Giuseppe's family. Giuseppe, 
Giuseppe's fragrant, loose, flagrant use of Rosa, 18 years his junior, and her daily presence in the home, in the home showed his tyranny over parents, siblings, wife, and children. In December 1904, Giuseppe's family hosted a welcome home for a minor returning from West Virginia, but refused Rosa's presence at the affair. Giuseppe erupted in anger, setting fire to the animal stall. Excuse me. Um, damn technology. Um, setting uh, fire to the animal stall uh, and incinerating his mother. It was at that time that Antonio returned to the Paese and he was greeted with this shame and confusion. His plans for Rosa was obviously mocked. She was in jail and pregnant. He still had to consider his daughter, so he took her with him and returned to West Virginia where there was work and paisani. But he lived in a, mine, in a company house with other miners. It wasn't a suitable place for the daughter, so she was placed at the house. We visited uh, the town, and uh, this is the site where the fire started, in the basement where they then kept animals. This is the jail where Rosa was housed and then began the long, month-long search for Rosa. We searched Konyomi, the last names of all of the people who appeared in the record, and could not find her. Could not find the two names of her lover. We could not find her name. And, um, um, and we, um, uh, until a cal Italian colleague suggested we look for a name Ruggiero, which was like De Giroux. We then commenced to do that, and we um, uncovered a lot of information on women who married Ruggiero men, the Ruggiero men, uh, but no Rosa or Giuseppe. We then found death certificates of two infants, Frank and John, both born on the same day. Their respective parents, however, had different names. We also found the boys' baptism records. Parents, both the same, but names unlike what we knew, but very close. So you can see the baptism records of, in fact, twins have different parents. So we discovered their boys, the church, the cemetery, but not Rosa or Giuseppe. So because of their past, the death of these twins, one for malnutrition, and the elusive her her history of their parents, we just gave up, gave up systematic works until, by chance, a gravestone, an internet photo linking this surname to Ruggiero, a very different name. And this name was present, again, with misspellings for the three senses we showed. And then the surprise of all surprises my colleague on this, Janet Salvati, knew the family, but she never knew this history. So once we met them, arms were open, and yet we had to tell them their grandmother's history, which they didn't know. We did. And I think this is a point Richard will like. Once we talked, and they knew we had respect for them, and they knew Janet, they knew of my family, but most of the tropes went to Michigan. They appreciated. They never knew. And so the story we tell is an honest story. And the family accepted it. Hesitant, one of the daughters was a little bit hesitant. But the two sons who actually lived with Rosa and Giuseppe accepted it. And so we got information from them. And what is this story? It's incredible, particularly from a gender perspective, because you have this powerful man who used this poor peasant girl in the Paese, and this little poor peasant girl, and then the West Virginia experience. So this is just an effort to summarize it, these two lives and the family. Unlike many Italian migrants, Giuseppe had been materially and socially graced in the Paese, son of a mule driver and father of his own family. 
yet he began work as a coal miner when he was in his mid-40s, more than two decades behind most men in plans and energy. His first American child was born when he was 57 years of age. Grandchildren remembered Giuseppe as a taciturn man who did not give them much attention. When he went outside to sit under the pine tree to smoke, he isolated himself in silence. Giuseppe listed none as occupation a few decades after his arrival in the U.S. But by that time, his two sons delivered milk sold by Rosa, and when they reached about age 13, they went into the mines. Memories of Giuseppe were largely confined to disconsolate effects of work, age, and communication, which stand in marked contrast to Rosa. Rosa, the poor peasant, whose diminished status would have remained unchanged if not worsened in Calabria, began her life in her mid-twenties in the U.S. No longer in the clutches of Paese or Paisani and a clouded pass, freed from hard consequences of the South Italian economy as well as custom, Rosa was able to use her resources and wit and labor, while the birth of four boys within 30 months took its toll in the deaths of the twins. Unlike Giuseppe and her paisani, Costanza and Teresa, the one who had the abortion, Rosa seemed invigorated by immigration. She gathered what grew wild like dandelions, chicoria, and poke salad, cultivated what could be consumed or sold, including, that's why I should use these glasses, including products from an herb garden, Rosa grew poppies for opium, a remedy that she used in her practice as a midwife, which was legal. She had a cow whose surplus milk was sold and a smokehouse to preserve meats. She crocheted bedspreads and dining room tablecloths still preserved in the family. So this is just an identification of the many products and services this woman generated on that little plot of land in West Virginia. In remembrance, memories of Rosa remain alive and vivid and indicate the effects of her ascent from a dependent and vulnerable young peasant in the Sela Mountains to an independent and valued matriarch in the West Virginia Hills. And this is her looking quite robust, 1944. She would have been 64 years of old with a friend, Annabelle, from next door. Now, that's gonna end enough of my uh, presentation. Uh, for tonight, but I hope that uh, you understand, at least from these last two cases, we can begin to build and try to, through these data sources originating in the mine explosion, combining Italy and interviews and uh, a number of other sources, uh, breaking the anonymity of some of these really inconsequential migrants. But what stories some of their lives have to tell? And we're, what are we doing? We're celebrating parades and festas and big shots getting awards and and we're not we're losing what, what, what was our background. And I'm not, I don't apologize for our humble background. It's kind of interesting. So that's it. I'm glad you came. It's not a big audience, but it's a good audience. <laughs>